Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. For if God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on his ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9 New International Version Hello, I'm Victoria K. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. We're very glad to be with you today as we continue the series we started several weeks ago on Anchored by Truth. We are calling this series 10 Facts Every Christian Needs to Know. In the studio today, we have R.D. Fierro. R.D. is an author and the founder of Crystal Sea Books. So far, we've covered seven of the ten facts, and we've done two other episodes to talk about what those facts mean. R.D., the purpose of this series is to give listeners ten solid facts that they can turn to when they encounter narratives in the world that try to cast doubt on the reliability of the Bible. It would take quite a while for us to go over all seven of those facts, but Why don't you catch us up on our latest couple, since they relate to our discussion today. For those listeners who want to listen to any of the episodes they might have missed, they are all available on their favorite podcast app or from our website, crystalseabooks.com. Well, I would also like to say hi to all the listeners joining us here today. We truly believe that this is one of the most important series that we've ever done on Anchored by Truth. Because as you just mentioned, We are going to build on facts number six and seven that help point out that some of the cultural narratives just don't have any basis in fact. Just as a brief review, the first five facts that we've covered in this 10 Facts That Every Christian Needs to Know series demonstrated that the popular narratives of deep time, evolution, and uniformitarianism do not possess nearly the level or quality of scientific support that they are normally presumed to possess. In short, those popular narratives just aren't trustworthy as a basis for forming a coherent worldview. And yet so many people today, including Christians, do use those narratives. They've accepted those narratives without question because those narratives circulate so widely in our culture today and are seemingly impervious to the criticism that is directed against them. So our first five facts in this series gave Christians a solid basis to begin questioning those narratives that are most often used as the basis for doing away with the need for God to explain the physical universe and life. With fact number six, we began our demonstration that the foundational book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, is in fact a trustworthy foundation for our understanding of the universe, of life, and of human history. In fact, number six showed that Moses was the author of the book of Genesis and the other books of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is a collective name for the first five books of the Bible. They are also sometimes referred to as the Torah, or five books of Moses. By reaffirming that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, we are establishing when those books were written, right? Right. The traditional date assigned to Moses writing the Pentateuch is in the 15th century BC, and many scholars will place the composition of those books starting around 1445 or 1446 BC, which is the so-called early date for the start of the Hebrew Exodus out of Egypt. But even the scholars that prefer the supposed late date for the Exodus, they would place the composition of the Pentateuch in the 13th century B.C. 
And those dates are in conflict with the dates some literal Bible critics have tried to assign to those books, which has the books being written as late as 400 or 500 BC. And the reason the critics want to assign those dates is that it allows them to claim that many of the prophecies contained in the Pentateuch weren't prophecies at all. But instead, the alleged writers were writing a sort of pious history to encourage the Jewish people who were then under the domination of foreign powers. Again, right. The liberal critics can't stand the thought that Moses, as well as all the other inspired prophets in the Bible, wrote accurate prophecies hundreds of years before certain events occurred. Fulfilled prophecy is a powerful argument that only an all-powerful, all-knowing God could supernaturally inspire the human authors of the Bible. So if the liberal critic can perform literary alchemy and turn prophecy into history, then the critic gets to argue against the inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility of the Bible. Ooh, I like that phrase. Literary alchemy. The critics do that a lot, don't they? They have to. If Moses correctly predicted that the Jews' descent into idolatry would result in them being conquered and deported from their promised land, it's a powerful indictment of those who attempt to dismiss the Bible's authenticity. So the seventh fact that we covered, and we did this in our last episode of Anchored by Truth, was that we can see from the genealogies contained in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis that Moses gave us an accurate record insofar as the repopulation of the earth is concerned. The Bible tells us that the ark, once the flood had abated, settled on the mountains of Ararat. It does not say Mount Ararat, as is sometimes thought by people who don't study the text carefully, but it just says the mountains of Ararat. In other words, it's naming a general region, and most commentators place that mountain range somewhere in modern-day Turkey. Now, since that's where the repopulation of the earth began, you would expect to see the tribes and nations that descended from Noah, his sons, and his grandsons to fan out from there. And indeed, that's what human history shows us. There are 16 names of Noah's grandsons contained in chapter 10. And in our last episode of Anchored by Truth, we trace the names of several of those grandsons and how their names are embedded in geographic sites or regions, as well as in the names of nations. For instance, we pointed out the descendants of one of Noah's grandsons, Tubal, began settling the country to the north of Turkey. Today, Tubal's name is commemorated in various places in both the nations of Georgia and Russia. And the prophet Ezekiel mentioned that Tubal along with Gog and Meshesh, and that's in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 1, are generally regarded as having settled territories to the north of Turkey. Well, Meshesh is the ancient name for Moscow, and Moscow is both the capital of Russia, and it's also the name that's given to the region that surrounds the city. And to this day, one section, the Mascara Lowland, still carries the name of Meshesh. It's virtually been unchanged by the ages, the thousands of years since the original settlers came there. Now, Tubal's name is preserved in the capital city of the nation of Georgia, to this day is called Tbilisi. Tubal's descendants also crossed the Caucasus Mountains, they migrated due northeast, and they gave their tribal name to the river Tubal, and hence to the famous Russian city of Tobolsk. So, knowing that Moses actually authored the Pentateuch under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit establishes when the book of Genesis was written, most likely in the 15th century BC, but certainly no later than the 13th century BC. As part of his record, Moses gave us the name of Noah's sons and grandsons. We can trace the expanding population of the post flood period by following the names of those grandsons in history and geography. Tracing the settlement patterns of Noah's grandsons and their descendants shows that Moses' record was accurate for nations and regions throughout Europe, Western Asia, the Middle East, and parts of Africa. We've established that through facts 6 and 7 of the 10 facts every Christian needs to know. But you said that today you want to show the Genesis record Moses wrote is reasonable even when you consider the entire earth. How is that possible? Well, we can demonstrate that Moses gave us an accurate record of the creation of the earth and its subsequent destruction by a global flood by taking a look at the current population of the entire earth. 
So the eighth fact that every Christian needs to know is that the biblical time periods and population sizes are far more reasonable than the evolutionary alternatives that are most commonly believed. By taking a look at the Earth's current population, we can see not only that Genesis history is an accurate history, but also that the alternative explanation, which centers around the idea of evolution, is deeply flawed. Now, bear in mind that the Bible tells us that the universe and the Earth were created a little over 6,000 years ago, and no more than 6,500 years. Now, the deep time and the evolutionary hypothesis tell us that the universe is 14.5 billion years old and that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. So you have a big contrast there between the Bible placing the creation of the Earth and universe a little over 6,000 years and then the evolutionary deep time hypothesis placing the creation of the Earth and the universe billions of years old. Well, the evolutionary hypothesis also tells us that the first human beings that came into existence came into existence at least a million years ago. And there are some historians that will tell us that the very earliest humans were using stone tools over two million years ago. Well, let's start with the fact that the Bible tells us that there were eight people on the ark. Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. Genesis chapter 5, verse 32 tells us that Noah had three sons. And interestingly, they were all born when Noah was over 500 years old. Then Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 tells us that God told Noah to take his whole family into the ark. And Genesis chapter 8, verse 18 says, quote, So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, unquote. So we can be very confident of the number of people that were available to begin the repopulation of the earth. There were at least three surviving couples, and it is possible that Noah and his wife might have had more children. This number is reinforced by what we heard in our opening scripture from 2 Peter. Peter tells us that God, quote, protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven other people, unquote. That gives a very firm starting point. And a quick internet search says that the world's current population is expected to cross the 8 billion point during 2022. So, the question is, can 6 or 8 people grow into a population of 8 billion in 4,500 years? And the answer may be surprising, but it is a very firm yes. Now to see why, let's start with the time periods that we get from the Bible. So for our purposes today, I'm going to use the time periods calculated by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, the lead scientist for Creation Ministries International. And these periods are available in his commentary on the first 11 chapters of Genesis entitled The Genesis Account. Now I like this as a source because Dr. Sarfati is not only very detailed in his presentation of the time periods, but he also, as they used to say in my math classes, presents his work. Dr. Sarfati believes that the earth was created in the year 4178 B.C., plus or minus 50 years. So I'm just going to use round numbers and say that the earth was created around 4200 B.C. Dr. Sarfati also believes that the flood occurred 1,656 years after creation. That would mean the flood occurred a little more than 2,500 years before Jesus was born. We live more than 2,000 years after Jesus was born. So, it's fair to say that we have those 4,500 years since the flood in which to achieve the necessary population growth. Right. The question is, what growth rate is necessary to achieve that level of population growth? And as I mentioned, the number may surprise you. So, surprise me. Well, in financial management, there is a well-known rule called the Rule of 72. The rule of 72 tells you how long it will take your money, or anything else for that matter, to double. So, for instance, if you invest your money at 6% per year, it would take 12 years for $100 to become $200. You divide 6 into 72, and you get 12. By the same token, if you could invest your money and get a 12% return... Oh, I wish. (laughs) Yes, you do. Anyway... If you could invest your money and get a 12% return, it would only take six years to double your money. 
At 12% interest, $100 becomes $200 in just six years. All this tells you why people are always seeking a better rate of return, especially in today's inflationary environment. Exactly. Well, the rule of 72 doesn't just work for money, it also works for people. So if the world's population since the flood had grown at an average rate of, say, 2% per year, it would have doubled every 36 years. And in 4,500 years, that means the Earth's population would have doubled 125 times. Well, here's where the surprise comes in. At an annual average growth rate of 2%, today you would have way more than 8 billion people on Earth. The actual annual average growth rate that you need to go from 6 people, assuming that Noah and his wife didn't have any more kids, to over 7 billion people in 4,500 years, the average annual growth rate you need is less than one half of 1%. Let me repeat that, because as you said, that is a surprise. To go from 6 people to over 7 billion people in a period of 4,500 years, you only need a growth rate of less than one half of 1%. This is a bit of a surprise. It certainly doesn't seem impossible. And it's not. The Encyclopedia Britannica claims that by the time of Christ, the world's population was about 300 million. And then apparently it didn't increase very much up to about A.D. 1000. And then the Earth's population went up and down in the Middle Ages because of wars, invasions, plagues, etc. But the world's population is thought to have reached 800 million by the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750. Now, that would have been an average annual growth rate in the 750 years from 1000 A.D. to 1750 A.D that would have been an average annual growth rate of about 0.13%. In other words, a little over a tenth of a percent per year. But by 1800, the population was thought to be 1 billion, and then the second billion was reached by 1930. Well, that was an average annual growth rate of a little over one-half of 1% annually. And that period of improved population growth, that's not very likely to be due to improved medicine because antibiotics and the vaccination campaigns that are largely regarded as improving health conditions, those didn't impact the population growth rate until after World War II, which of course was between 1939 and 1945. But from 1930 to 1960, the population of the Earth reached about 3 billion. And so the growth rate during that 30-year period was about 1.3% annually. Then by 1974, the fourth billion was reached, and so the growth rate for those 14 years was about 2.1%. And then from 1974 to 1990, when the world hit 5 billion, the growth rate had slowed some to about 1.4%. And then the world population reached 6 billion in 1999 and 7 billion in 2011, and it's forecast across 8 billion in 2022. So that much improved increase in population growth since World War II is most likely due to fewer infant deaths and to improved health care because that obviously leads to less loss of population from disease. In other words, during those time periods for which we have much more accurate data, we can see that a population growth rate of 1.5% per year is not at all out of the question. At times, we seem to have had periods of slower growth in population, but at times, we have had much faster growth. Right. So, let's step back and take a look at what this means, and let's focus on our eighth fact. The eighth fact that every Christian needs to know is that the biblical time periods and population sizes are far more reasonable than the alternatives that are commonly believed. Because we've already seen that to get from three reproducing couples to seven or eight billion people in a period of 4,500 years, you do not need an outlandish population growth rate. One half of 1% a year will do it. So that raises a huge problem for the evolutionary hypothesis, which of course is the alternative to the biblical proposition, because evolutionists believe that the human race is a million years old or older, not just 4,500 years of population growth, but a million years of population growth. So that raises a big question, where are all the people? What you're saying is, is that if the human race really were a million years old, the human race would have had a lot more time in which to reproduce. 
If the human population could go from six people to over seven billion in a period of 4,500 years, there should be a lot more people on the earth now if the human race were hundreds of thousands of years older. That's not an idea you hear being discussed much. No, it's not. Evolutionists claim that mankind evolved from apes about a million years ago or more. Well, here's some interesting numbers from an article on the Creation Ministries International website entitled, appropriately enough, "Where are all the people?" If the human population had grown at just one one hundredth of a percent per year since its supposed emergence, that would mean it would double every seven thousand years. Well, if it had grown by just one one hundredth of one percent since the humans first emerged. Today on the Earth, there would be a number that is ten, followed by forty-two zeros. Now, to put that number in context, let's say that every individual on the Earth was standing in about one square meter. We're only allocating one square meter per person over the surface of the entire Earth. Well, the land surface area of the whole Earth is only one point five times ten to the fourteenth square meters. So, if every one of those individual square meters was made into a world the size of ours, all those worlds put together would still only have a surface area that was able to fit a fraction of that number of people. It could only fit a number of ten to the twenty-eighth power of people. So those who adhere to the evolutionary story say that likely disease, famine, war, etc. meant that the numbers of the people on the Earth remained constant for most of that million-year period. But what that would mean is that mankind was literally on the brink of extinction for over 99.9 percent of his supposed history. Talk about asking someone to exhibit faith in a proposition that stretches credulity. The biblical concept is an absolute certainty compared to that, and that, of course, doesn't end the problems with the evolutionary hypothesis. We supposedly routinely unearth fossils and bones from tens or hundreds of millions of years ago. The dinosaurs were supposed to have perished 65 million years ago when a giant meteor struck the Earth. Yet we find their bones all the time, and we don't just find bones from the T-Rex-sized dinosaurs. We find bones from dinosaurs the size of deer or chickens. So if mankind had been in existence for a million years, and even if the population was nowhere near current levels, there should be lots of bones of humans lying about, and we don't find them. I guess besides the question, where are all the people? We can ask the question, where are all the bones? Well, evolutionists claim that there was a Stone Age that lasted about a hundred thousand years, and supposedly during that Stone Age, the Earth's population was somewhere between one million and ten million. Well, fossil evidence shows that even people from the so-called primitive ages buried their dead, and they often buried them with artifacts. Cremation was really not practiced until relatively recent times in terms of evolutionary thinking. Ancient people tended to bury their dead. Well, if there were just one million people alive during this supposed Stone Age of a hundred thousand years, with an average generation time of twenty-five years, during that period they should have buried four billion bodies. If there were ten million people alive during their Stone Age, it would mean there were forty billion bodies buried in the Earth. So, if the evolutionary time scale were correct. Then we would expect the skeletons of those buried bodies to still be largely present after just a hundred thousand years or so, because as we've discussed, many ordinary bones claim to be much older than a hundred thousand years, older than a million years, older than ten million years. Many ordinary bones that are claimed to be much more ancient have been discovered. And even if somehow all the bones and bodies had disintegrated, the artifacts that were buried with those bodies should still be found. But we have not come across those treasure troves of either bodies or artifacts. Again, the purpose of this Ten Facts Every Christian Needs to Know series is to enable people to put a solid intellectual foundation beneath their conviction that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. In our day and time, we need to ensure that we have that foundation because the Bible is under attack from just about every quarter. We are told by popular culture that the Bible is not relevant because it is not accurate. But we have also been discussing here today the Bible's continuing relevance is established by the abundant evidence that it is accurate. Yes, 
So again, let's step back and see why these latest three facts are so important. Our sixth fact, the fact that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, including the book of Genesis, tells us when Genesis was written. And a reasonable date for that is the mid-1400s B.C. Our seventh fact is that we can trace the lines of descent of Noah's grandsons down through history and geography. So that fact confirms that the flood story in Genesis is true. So we can confirm the truth of the Genesis account in the history and geography of Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and parts of Africa, such as Egypt and Ethiopia. And the fact that the population of the earth is easily achievable from six people starting 4,500 years ago shows that, in effect, the entire human population around the world testifies to the accuracy of the book of Genesis, especially the flood account. Moses could not have known what the population of the earth would be in 2022, but God did. Moses just knew to record the history God gave to him faithfully and accurately, and we see the fidelity of his account all around us today. This sounds like a good time for a prayer. To close, for today let's listen to a prayer for the missionaries that God sends to bring his word to a world that needs his encouragement. A prayer for Christian missionaries. Father of redemption, you are a powerful and loving God and our ever faithful tower of refuge and strength. You are a God who takes pleasure in rescuing lost sheep and in bringing them into your kingdom. You are the God of the ends and the means. May all the earth sing praises to your name. Lord, the Bible rightly asks how the lost can hear of the salvation available through Christ's life, death, and resurrection unless preachers are sent to proclaim the gospel. We know they cannot, and today, a great many of your faithful people continue to leave their families and homes to travel to remote corners to preach your message of hope and good news. We want to pray for all these missionaries and to thank you for your provision of them. Lord, we know that many missionaries preach the gospel in lands where your word is not welcome. In fact, in some lands, to speak about you brings a sentence of death. We know that there are many places where government leaders and authorities will exercise the full power of their offices to oppose and persecute your messengers. Therefore, we pray for special protection for all those who preach in these dangerous countries and places. We ask that you watch over these missionaries protecting them as they travel and minister and confounding the efforts of those who seek their harm. We also pray that you give them fertile fields in which to plant your word, which is the seed of true life. We pray that you would open the hearts of those who hear the word. Give them the courage to accept Christ, even as they risk their lives to do so. Bring leaders out of the converted so that ministries and churches once begun will continue to grow and expand. Provide the resources the missionaries and churches need to sustain themselves, whether it be Bibles, educational literature, money, or resources for daily living. Show us how you would have us help and serve in bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. While not all are called to go or preach, we know that there is a way that all of us can contribute. Help us to be persistent in our prayers and make us fervent in our desire to see your word spread and your kingdom grow. Christ commanded that his word be spread until he returns again. So in his holy name, we pray for his kingdom and his messengers. Amen. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also, or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalcbooks.com, where we're not perfect, but our boss is.